coming up on this episode of Murky Seb's Wild Underwater Adventures. On this adventure, we're checking out the rivers that flow into and out of the Mary River. There's a whole lot of unique species that live around here, and I hope that we can track down some of them, like the incredibly rare Mary River Cod. Who knows what else we'll find in these remote creeks up in the wilderness, but I'm really excited to find out. So come along on this adventure and let's see what creatures are living in these rivers. We have gone even further down the Mary River, around a place called Imbal, to check out some of the creeks that flow into the Mary River. Unfortunately, it was a sad start to this journey. All along the road was a decimated native forest, not by a natural disaster, but instead a result of the state government's initiative to remove as much native wilderness as possible and replace it with pine trees. I just, I just woke up and was brushing my teeth and look what I found outside of my tent. Thankfully, waking up to this beautiful creature made me feel much happier. This amazing animal is a lace monitor and look at that awesome pattern it has. Lace monitors are also often referred to as goannas and if you're familiar with the Komodo dragon, these guys may look very similar to you as they are in fact a closely related cousin with their common ancestor living around 13 million years ago. The lace monitor can grow up to about 2 meters long and live for about 20 years. They are expert climbers with those really long claws being able to easily scale a tree or rocky cliff. They have a varied diet consisting of scavenging dead carcasses, eating insects, reptiles, mammals, birds and their eggs, especially that of the scrub turkey. The goannas are often seen with injuries from the scrub turkeys defending their babies from the hungry monitor. During the summer is their breeding season. Males will fight each other to win over the female by wrestling while standing on their back legs. Up to six males may gather to fight over one lucky female. The females then lay around eight eggs in active termite nests or on the ground or even in trees. The eggs then hatch in about six months time. Of course, these monitors are around our tent because people in the campsites have food which the monitors have found clever ways of acquiring. They can easily get into a rubbish bag and remove any food they find. Research has also suggested that the lace monitors are actually venomous, just like their Komodo cousins. So try your best to keep a good distance and avoid getting bitten by one. They use that tongue to get a scent of their surrounding area and be able to go out and investigate whatever they smell. Clearly, the monitor has found something of interest to go and investigate. What an awesome creature to wake up to. After that beautiful encounter, we went to the nearby creek to investigate what creatures call this river home. And we just got a glimpse at this beautiful bird which appeared to be a type of kingfisher. I had a good look in the creek, but I didn't notice any movement. A large portion of my time is spent just wading by creeks, trying to spot any sign of movement. But as we moved further downstream, I spotted what looked like some fish, so I had a look under the water to investigate. And under these fallen branches and logs were a decent amount of crimson spotted rainbow fish, and a few gudgeons and glass fish swimming alongside them. After having a quick look at these beautiful fish, it was time to move upstream and see what the water looked like closer to its source. I'm off a very remote river at the moment. We've driven for about an hour up a windy road and we've found this creek that isn't flowing at the moment. So maybe the fish will be trapped in this little spot. Let's have a look and see if we can find some of them. Underwater was quite murky, but there was what appears to be some kind of foxtail plant growing in abundance here. But there was no fish, at least on this side of the log. But on the other side of the log was a totally different story. There were so many native fish. 
I was greeted by incredibly large skulls of the crimson spotted rainbow fish. These ones you may notice look slightly different to the ones we found in our last video, even though they are found in the same river system. There are mountains between them, which mean there are slight differences in the two varieties of rainbow fish. Like these ones don't have as distinct red fins and much more blue and green in their body. They are so beautiful to see, and in such great numbers too. Occasionally we see a Pacific blue eye schooling alongside the rainbow fish. They are much smaller and the males have bright yellow fins, with of course a distinct blue eye. We were in a remote river up in the mountains, and thankfully it was a sanctuary for native fish. Amazingly, there weren't any non-natives living in this river, which is very rare to find. Obviously these fish are confined to a pool that isn't flowing at the moment, which is why we're seeing so many in one place. Normally when the water's flowing, the fish would be much more spread out around this river. I love looking at these rainbow fish. I'm really pleased that we managed to find this big school of them and the blue eyes as well. Such an interesting underwater landscape from above it didn't look very interesting at all. It was all murky and covered in leaves. But as you can see below the surface, it's full of life. And it's a very beautiful scene to look at. Judging by the size of these rainbows, most of them were likely born during the last breeding season and are several months old. It won't be long until they are ready to breed again in just a few months time. Crimson spotted rainbows lay their eggs on the roots by the riverbank and other underwater plants, usually right before the summer rains appear. During a controlled study comparing six native species of fish, including the crimson spotted rainbow fish, and the introduced gambusia, which was brought here by some very stupid humans to control mosquito numbers, this study was able to prove that the crimson spotted rainbow consistently ate significantly more mosquitoes than any other type of fish in the study, including the gambusia. Just over the other side of the road before we left, I thought I'd have a quick look to see if there were any fish. And wow, did I get lucky. Between the fallen branches that looked almost like mangroves were not only more rainbow fish, but also down by the riverbed we have a school of Marjorie's hardy heads, which aren't a very colorful fish and don't get anywhere near as large as the rainbow fish do. Marjorie's hardy heads range from the Mary River in Queensland to the Clarence River in New South Wales. They like to eat algae, small crustaceans and insects. They got their name because a man named Gilbert Whitley, who may have named this species after his sister, Marjorie Fruver. Very little information is publicly available about the Marjorie's hardy heads. We also occasionally see several blue eyes in this area as well. There must be a bigger school of them off in the deeper water with many more blue eyes, but I couldn't get any further down the river to investigate. I really love seeing these fish in this environment. They all look really healthy and happy to be in this creek. I spent almost an hour watching this spot, taken in by its beauty. We also see a few smelts swim by, which are the long, slender, golden fish, swimming in the mid-water column alongside the rainbow fish. Unlike the hardy heads, which tend to school mostly by themselves, smelt and rainbow fish both love to eat insects that land on the water, and especially mosquito larvae. If you have a body of water and need to keep mosquitoes under control, there is no fish better than the crimson spotted rainbow fish, smelt, or even the Pacific blue eyes. We can see some more of the foxtail plants growing in the background. And we actually get quite a rare glimpse at how the Marjorie's hardy head eat, pecking along the leaves, sticks, and rocks for tiny bits of algae and microorganisms. I'm surprised we didn't see more shrimp in this area. I really hope this river remains as untouched as it is and stays as a sanctuary for these species that call it home. 
I will be returning here in the future to see how these areas have changed after the recent floods compared to when I filmed this which was during a period of it having hardly rained for many, many months. Smelt range from the Fitzroy River in South Queensland down to the Murray River mouth in South Australia. They like to eat little insects like mosquitoes and small crustaceans. They don't breed until they're about a year old, but they don't tend to live much past two years. The females will lay around a thousand eggs every three or four days during their mating season, which fall and stick to the plants and debris on the riverbed. The babies then hatch after about 10 days and like to live in large groups. Very little information is publicly available about Marjorie's hardyheads, so we're just going to have to go by what we can observe them behaving like in the wild. The Marjorie's hardy heads tend to stay near the bottom in their own group, and they don't tend to swim around in the midwater anywhere near as much as the rainbows and smelt do. These fallen sticks and branches make the ideal hiding spot for fish to congregate around. They feel safe being around these sticks in the water because it's harder for a predator like a bird to be able to find them when they have a little bit of shelter to hide around. It also made for a very interesting underwater landscape. So if you have fish tanks of your own and you like to make them look natural, this may be a really effective theme to try and aim towards for your fish tank at home. The big schools of rainbows and smelt would gradually appear and disappear again as they swam into the deeper water, presumably searching for more food and then coming back out to the safety underneath the branches in the shallow water. Perhaps to investigate my camera as much as I was investigating what they were up to. But they certainly feel safe around those branches and they feel safe in big groups. There weren't many species of plant here. There was basically just that foxtail looking plant and then bits of algae growing around. I was surprised we didn't find more different types of plants living here, but it's interesting we managed to find that foxtail. I hope you enjoyed coming along on this adventure and learning about the species that call this part of the river home. We're going to be venturing even further downstream in the next episode, so make sure to subscribe in order to see when that comes out. And until next time, keep it murky.